Gadgets Field Trip. We're going on a visit. Inspector Gadgets Field Trip. Come on, let's go with him. Inspector Gadgets Field Trip. What's that you ask? What is it? Inspector Gadgets Field Trip. Well, no one wants to miss it. Inspector Gadget here in Egypt with my colossal friends Ramses, Ramses, and Ramses. Sounds like an Egyptian law firm. I wonder why they all have the same name. Oh, they're all statues of the same person, Egyptian Pharaoh Ramses II. Let's investigate some of Ramses' fellow pharaohs, including King Tut, and Queen Cleopatra. Go, go, Gadget Field Trip. Egypt is in the northeastern corner of Africa, tucked between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. Egypt is mostly dry and barren desert, so most Egyptians live along the banks of the Nile, the longest river in the world. Around 3100 BC, the small kingdoms along the Nile were formed into one big kingdom under the first of Egypt's 31 dynasties. What is a dynasty, you ask? A dynasty is a long line of rulers from the same family. Egypt flourished under dynasties for about 3,000 years until it was eventually conquered by Rome in 30 BC. Located just outside Egypt's capital city of Cairo, the pyramids of Giza are the tallest monuments ever created to honor Egypt's royalty. The Great Pyramid was built around 2600 BC as a tomb for the Pharaoh Khufu. Wowzers, no wonder they call this pyramid great. It's as tall as a 40-story building. It covers 13 acres and is made of 2.5 million blocks of limestone. Looks like we'll be taking the stairs. My keen detective sense tells me that King Khufu is still buried somewhere inside this pyramid. Let's investigate. Aha! This looks like the burial chamber. But where's King Khufu? It says here in my gadget guidebook to Giza that the pyramids were looted by bandits who stole the treasures and mummies hidden inside. About 400 miles south of Cairo lies the Valley of the Kings. Many pharaohs were buried here, including the one and only King Tutankhamun. His pharaonic friends called him King Tut. My keen sense of detection tells me Tut's tomb is around here somewhere. Maybe you can help me find it. Go, go, Gadget Copter! Aha! Just as I suspected. Touch two. But where's his pyramid? Would you believe his mummy had it moved? Would you believe his daddy? How about my uncle Gadget Sphinx? By about 1800 BC, pyramids went out of style. However, a new kind of royal burial ground was devised. The 
newer tunes were chiseled right into the side of a mountain here in the Valley of the Cape. Inside these tombs, you can walk deep inside magical halls covered with hieroglyphs. This was an ancient form of writing which used pictures to represent words and sounds. Wowzers! Once upon a time, this was the eternal resting place of King Ramses IV. Like these, are, most of the tombs in the Valley of the Kings were looted by treasure hunters. So, what did the fourth Ramses have in common with Tutankhamun? They were both buried here. But Tut's treasures have been taken far away to the city of Cairo. Let's explore. Let's go, go to Cairo's Egyptian Antiquities Museum. Wowzers! Mummies and coffins and cats. Oh, my! Looks like the Tut treasures just barely outnumber the Tut tourists. Wowzers! This stuff must have cost King Tut a pyramid of pennies. King Tutankhamun was actually only nine or ten years old when he became ruler of Egypt. And here's his boy-sized throne chair to prove it. When Tut was only about 18 or 19 years old, he died of unknown causes. His body was mummified and a spectacular golden death mask was placed over his head and shoulders. Tut's golden coffin was placed in a larger coffin called a sarcophagus and then in a larger one. Tut and his treasures were buried in the Valley of the King, safely hidden from the tomb bandits for over 3,000 years. Then, in 1922, a group of explorers broke through a concealed entrance and were stunned to uncover the extraordinary riches of King Tut's tomb. And now, an Inspector Gadget field trip fact. Ancient Egyptians believed in life after death. Therefore, along with the mummy, ancient Egyptians buried favorite earthly gadgets. Belongings like toy boats, jewelry, and mummified pets to keep them company in their next life. Unfortunately, mummified pets don't make the greatest company. They can't speak, but they do know how to play dead. Welcome back as we frolic with the pharaohs on our field trip through ancient Egypt. We were just talking about the ancient Egyptians' belief in the afterlife. I wonder if they used aftershave in their afterlife. Boy, I know one pharaoh who sure could have used a good shave. And this bearded pharaoh was no boy. It was Queen Hatshepsut. And if you say her name quick enough, it kind of sounds like hot chicken soup. At least that's the nickname the locals have given her. Near the Valley of the Kings, Queen Hatshepsut built herself an enormous temple. Of course, she had a little help. The temple had massive columns and stone guards. The guards helped keep out the other queen wannabes, like Queen Beef Barley Soup and Queen Sweet and Sour Cabbage Soup. But what's with that silly beard? Let's go go up those ramps and check it out. A fake beard was a symbol of kingship and was worn by both male and female pharaohs during special occasions. During her reign, Queen Hatshepsut was a pretty popular pharaoh. Her Egyptian high school class even voted her most likely to lead. At last, we come to Egypt's final pharaoh, whose life reads like an ancient Egyptian soap opera. If you guessed Queen Cleopatra, you're right. During Cleopatra's reign as pharaoh of Egypt, the Romans repeatedly tried to take her land. But instead of fighting the Romans, Cleopatra flirted with them. By becoming the girlfriend of Roman leader Julius Caesar, Cleopatra successfully kept parts of Egypt under her rule. In 44 BC, Julius Caesar was killed, 
and Mark Antony took control of part of the Roman Empire. So Cleopatra conveniently became Mark Antony's girlfriend. When Mark Antony died, Cleopatra finally realized that her lipstick diplomacy probably wasn't going to save Egypt from the Roman Empire. So, at the age of 39, Cleopatra ended her own life, possibly, by a venomous bite from a cobra, the very symbol of Egyptian royalty. Talk about biting the hand that feeds you. I hope you had a good time on our field trip through Egypt, peeking at the pyramids, touring around the tombs, and clowning around with Cleopatra. Until next time, go, go, gadget field trip. Inspector Gadget here on my latest top secret assignment to explore the third largest country in the world, China. Would you believe that nearly one out of every five people on Earth is Chinese? That's amazing! A new baby is born here in China about every two seconds. Grab your chopsticks and hop on your bicycle. It's time to explore one of the world's oldest living civilizations, China. country, Zhumhua, or Middle Country, probably because the ancients believed China was the center of the world. Go, go, gadget, go! Actually, China is in East Asia. It's so big that if you head east, you can't miss it. It shares borders with 14 other countries, including Russia to the north and India to the south. The capital of China is Beijing. Today, the center of Chinese life is in Beijing, and in Beijing, it's hip to be square. That is if you're Tiananmen Square. At about 100 acres, Tiananmen Square is the largest public square in the world. It's so big, the corners don't even know each other. Each day in Tiananmen Square, the crowds gather to watch the guards raise the Chinese flag. Gee. Those guys don't miss a beat. They step in perfect time. When the flag finally goes up, the Chinese national anthem rings out across the square. This colorful Chinese bird is made of paper, and you don't have to feed it. It is believed that the Chinese invented the kite. They've been flying them for centuries. Tiananmen Square is surrounded by monuments and museums that honor the people of China. The square is named after the Tiananmen, or Gate of Heavenly Peace, that sits at the north boundary. Wowzers! Look at that picture of the chief. Actually, it's a chairman. Chairman Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong founded the People's Republic of China in 1949. Mao believed that communism, or common ownership of property, would help make China stronger. Chairman Mao is no longer alive, but communism in China still lives today. Before communism, powerful families known as dynasties ruled the land. 24 emperors and their courts called this imperial palace their home, and the public was strictly forbidden. The penalty for trespassing was death. Some barbarians took the risk, but getting in wasn't easy. First, you had to be a great swimmer. The palace moat is about 50 yards wide. Then you had to be a mountain climber to scale these 35-foot high walls. They should have just used a go-go gadget neck. And you thought those daring barbarians were sticking their necks out. Wowzers! Inside the walls are nearly 250 acres of palaces, courtyards, and gardens. 
Of course, there is an easier way to get in. The main entrance to the palace is here at the Wu Men or Meridian Gate, which stands 125 feet tall. That way, dragons don't have to duck their heads. The Wu Men Gate is also known as the Gate of the Five Phoenixes because of the five pavilions at its base. The security at the palace was so strict that once these gates were closed each night at sunset, even the emperor himself could not open them. Time for a fascinating field trip back. The Chinese built their buildings with curved roofs to keep away evil spirits. They believed that spirits traveled in straight lines so the curves would naturally confuse them. When we return, we'll go inside the gates of the Forbidden City. Welcome back to our field trip through China and the Forbidden City. Inside the Wuman Gate is the first of many courtyards. Since the emperors were considered sons of heaven, they brought harmony to the earth by laying out the city symmetrically. Important buildings face south called the provider of all blessings, the sun. Plus that way, the emperors could lay out and work on their tanks. Here we cross the bridge of the Golden Water, a river that runs through the Forbidden City. The Gate of Supreme Harmony leads to the city's inner sanctum and is guarded by two bronze lions. On the left is the female with her paw on her baby cub, and on the right side is the male. Dragons can be seen all over the Forbidden City. The Chinese believed they protected the palace and brought good fortune. I'll stick with my lucky rabbit's point. Through the gate is another courtyard that holds up to 90,000 people, in case the emperor was in the mood for a lot of company. Facing the courtyard is the Hall of Supreme Harmony, where the Emperor sat for special occasions. For non-special occasions, he just went to his room. There are three flights of stairs that lead to the hall. Coincidentally, they also lead away from the hall. The middle one features a ramp carved out of white marble that only the Emperor could pass over. He didn't walk, of course. He was carried into the hall in his palanquin. Kind of like a royal sedan chair. Must have saved a fortune on royal jogging shoes. Inside the hall are many treasures, including 18 bronze incense burners and a nine dragon screen. In all, there are six main palaces and lots of other smaller buildings in the city, containing over nine Thousand rules. Wow! Did you know that a six-year-old boy named Pu Yi was the last emperor of China? That's about the same age as this emperor wannabe. Except he looks a little too friendly to rule a billion people. Coal Hill or Jin Sun Park is a man-made peak made from the dirt dug out of the palace moat, which tells me it was pretty muddy up there at first. Hundreds of stairs lead to the top of what was once a private imperial garden. Coal Hill is a great place for views of Beijing. Wowzers! Barbarians are trying to push down the city walls. Go, go, gadget binoculars! Actually, these women are practicing Qigong, an ancient meditative exercise that helps strengthen different parts of the body. These women look like they're practicing to swim the moat, but it's just another form of exercise to unite the mind and body. This is called Tai Chi Chuan. The practice of Tai Chi, or shadow boxing, is based on the martial arts and is close to 1,000 years old. What's feeling good without looking your best? In the morning, outdoor barbers will give you a haircut and shave right on the street. A free rinse is included if it rains. 
After their morning exercise, the Chinese often visit one of Beijing's many street markets to buy fresh vegetables and produce. But don't buy too much. More often than not, you'll only have a bicycle to carry the groceries home. The Chinese average less than one car for every 500 people, which is a tight squeeze even for short trips to the marketplace. So the main means of local transportation is the bicycle. In fact, there are more bicycles in Beijing than people. Riding a bicycle through Beijing is one of the best ways to explore the city. Here, riders park their bikes to watch a Chinese man teach a foreigner the art of Peking opera. One of the instruments used in the opera is called the Jinghu. It sounds like a scratchy violin. Wow, it's time to gallop out of here. I hope you enjoyed our forbidden field trip through China. We flapped the flag in Tiananmen Square, scaled the walls of the Imperial Palace, dropped in on the 9,000 rooms of emperors, hung out on Coal Hill, and peddled with the people. Until next time, go, go, gadget field trip. for the tallest, the coolest, and the weirdest parts of Italy. We've got a lot to see, so let's go, go, gadget field trip. I'm here in Venice, Italy. Wowzers, it sure is wet up to my gadget knees in high water. Venice is actually made up of hundreds of little islands connected by hundreds of little bridges, connected by a lot of singing gondoliers. They keep the fish entertained. I'm standing in St. Mark's Square, the center of Venice. This is where the action's really hopping. Especially if you're a pigeon. Here in the center of Venice is a huge bell tower. In Italy, a bell tower is called a campanile. 
Ask not for whom the company tolls. It tolls for pigeons. This is the Campanile in St. Mark's Square. Galileo, the famous scientist and astronomer, used the top of this huge bell tower to demonstrate his new invention. No, not the huge bell, the telescope. Because there's so much water in Venice, buildings were built on stilts to keep them dry. But the Campanile was so popular that the people of Venice, or Venetians, as they like to call themselves, kept adding to it. It got so heavy, the stilts collapsed, taking the whole tower with them. You can hear the bells clanging all the way to Rome, which is where the original architects moved after the accident. When the tower was rebuilt, they added twice as many stilts to keep the bells in the belfry. Once you reach the top of the tower, you'll find five different bells, each with a different ring. These different rings were used to tell the Venetians important things they needed to know, like Bing Bing Bong or Bong Bong Bing, which meant, look out, the tower's falling again. Actually, one bell meant the start of the workday. A different sound meant that it was noon, time for lunch, my favorite. Then there's my not-so-favorite, the bell that warned the people of an execution. Luckily, they don't use that bell anymore. Hey, maybe they could use it to ring in the new year. Wowzers, you can see all of Venice from up here, especially the parts that aren't underwater. What a view! Of course, this isn't the original view, because this isn't the original tower. When the tower collapsed, an exact copy was built in its place. An exact copy of the view just kind of followed along naturally. There's something you don't see every day. A winged lion standing on top of a pillar, probably keeping his feet dry. Actually, that's a statue called the Winged Lion of St. Mark. It's the symbol of the city of Venice. That's the famous clock tower of St. Mark's Square, a tower with plenty of time on its hands which is better than having a winged lion scratching around on its face. Go, go, Gadget Lane! Here's an Inspector Gadget field trip fact. The bell on top of the clock tower of St. Mark's Square has been struck so many times, they had to rotate it so there was a new surface to strike. That's a lot of bing-bonging in the belfry. We'll investigate as soon as I rest my gadget legs. Inspector Gadget here, in front of the world-famous clock tower of St. Mark's Square. This clock can tell you the position of the sun and moon in the sky. It can tell the signs of the zodiac, but it can't tell them much. Oh, yes, it even tells the time. What's that on top of the clock tower? Oh, they're bionic statues. Hi, guys. What a bunch of stiffs. These statues are known as the Moors. According to my gadget computer, they're made of bronze and they strike the huge bell every hour on the hour. Wowzers, that's loud. Keep it down, don't you know what time it is? Oh, I guess you do. There's no better place in the world to use my gadget telescope than here in St. Mark's Square. Makes me feel like Galileo. On a clear day, you can see the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Now that's a powerful telescope. And that's a tower in need of investigating. 
The tower was originally designed by Bananas Pizza Nose. No, that's Bananas Pizzano. He designed the tower to be a staggering 328 feet high. Construction was stopped at only 179 feet to keep the tower from leaning all the way over. The construction workers kept sliding off the top. If they hadn't quit, it would have been an arch. And who wants to see the leaning arch of Pisa? The leaning tower is actually a bell tower for the local church. To test your alertness, what is a bell tower called in Italy? A campanile. But why does it lean? My gadget computer tells me it started leaning before workers even finished the first level. Probably because the ground is softer under one side and the heavy marble tower started to squash the soil. Ever since it started to lean, people have tried to unlean the leaning tower. Starting at the third level, the huge columns that support each level were actually made shorter on one side to try and even out the lean. Even when the tower was finished, the heaviest bells were put on one side to try and weigh down the tower. But it kept on leaning. Visitors came from all over the world to see the famous leaning tower. So the people of Pisa stopped trying to straighten the tower and just tried to keep it from collapsing. Especially on top of paying customers. Galileo, the famous Italian scientist, must have really loved bell towers. Not only did he use the Campanile in Venice to demonstrate his telescope, but he used the leaning tower of Pisa to help with another experiment. Legend has it, he stood at the top of the tower and dropped two cannonballs. One of the cannonballs was very heavy, the other much lighter. He dropped them both at exactly the same time. Galileo dropped the different sized cannonballs, but they hit the ground at the same time, proving his theory that objects fall at the same speed even if they're different in weight. This is known as the law of falling bodies. The leaning tower of Pisa leans a whopping 15 feet to the south. That means if you stood on top, you would be 15 feet closer to Venice than if you stood at the bottom. Wowzers! That's as long as my gadget mobile. I hope you've enjoyed our field trip as much as Galileo and I have. Well, me anyway. We've climbed to the top of a huge bell tower, saw beautiful clocks, and found out what makes a leaning tower lean. Stay tuned for more exciting field trip action when we return. Inspector Gadget here in not so foggy San Francisco, California, where I thought I'd need my gadget debugger goggles. Let me check my top secret instructions from the chief. Investigate gold on Golden Gate Bridge. Take cable car to other famous sites. And wait for cable car to stop before you get off. On our last field trip, I left it in San Francisco. Maybe it's at the toll booth on the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, the Golden Gate Bridge is probably San Francisco's most recognizable symbol. It's also its most recognizable bridge. Where exactly is San Francisco? Go, go, get it close. Go to the west coast of the United States in Northern California. When you hit border, you've gone too far. 
The Golden Gate Bridge connects San Francisco to Sausalito, California. Aha! Another top secret field trip fact. The words Golden Gate actually refer to the waterway which connects the San Francisco Bay to the Pacific Ocean. This bridge isn't golden, it's orange. Good thing they didn't paint it purple. Who'd want to sing San Francisco open your purple gate? Wowzers, this bridge needs to go on a diet. It weighs 887,000 tons. That's as much as 170,000 elephants. Each tower of the Golden Gate Bridge rises 746 feet high. Up to 40 million cars cross this bridge each year. That means over a billion cars in the last 50 years. They even charge a toll for my gadget mobile. The deck of the bridge is literally suspended in midair by vertical ropes held up by cables which are draped over the top of the tower. That's why it's called a suspension bridge. 318 feet of cold water right beneath the span. So don't go, go over the edge without your gadget swim fin. The Golden Gate Bridge is one of the world's most spectacular engineering marvels. Would you believe men without bionic gadgets built this bridge by hand? Would you believe steam shovels? How about a sandbox and three kids with a pail? Luckily for the bridge builders, not to mention the boats floating underneath, safety nets were hung below the bridge so workers wouldn't fall into the frigid waters below. They caught 19 less than sure-footed workers. What a riveting experience. 600,000 rivets were used on each tower to keep the bridge together. Wowzers, that's over a million rivets. The building of the Golden Gate Bridge was good for construction workers. Many safety laws came into being. Ouch! It was the first job where hard hats were required. Workers were even tied to the bridge so they wouldn't be gone with the wind. 80,000 miles of wire no thicker than a pencil were wound and spun together to make the three inch thick cable. That's enough wire to wrap around the earth almost four times. It just seemed easier to make the bridge out of it. Painting the bridge is a never ending process. It takes 10,000 gallons of orange paint to cover the entire bridge. That's enough paint to cover about 500 orange houses. Finally, in May 1937, after four years and 25 million hours of work, the Golden Gate Bridge was finished. 200,000 people walked across the bridge that day. After waiting that long, it seemed like the thing to do. Stay tuned for more riveting San Francisco fun. But first, an Inspector Gadget field trip fact. At 4,200 feet, the Golden Gate was the longest single span bridge in the world. Today, the longest single span bridge is the Humber Bridge in England. It's 4,626 feet long, but it won't get you to San Francisco. Welcome back to San Francisco. There's the famous island prison called Alcatraz. I've sent a few criminals there in my time. They say it's a great place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. And there's the Bay Bridge. Downtown, even the Transamerica building and the Golden Gate Bridge. Loud, ready, fire! We're at Fort Point National Historic Site at the base of the Golden Gate Bridge. Go, go, gadget cannonball! Oh, that's right. I don't have a cannonball. Fort Point is one of my favorite places. 
It was built in 1853 to protect the San Francisco Bay Area from hostile fleets. It must have worked because it's still here. Wowzers! More than 8 million bricks were used to build the 5 foot 7 inch thick walls that protect this fort. Over the years, hundreds of cannons were mounted here. One of them could shoot a cannonball 3.2 miles away. 465 American soldiers lived here during the Civil War. They had to sleep two to a bed, facing opposite directions. It was a strict rule that they wash their feet twice a week and their socks twice a day, I hope. And they thought the cannons were keeping the enemy away. You don't want to powder your nose in the powder room at Fort Point. It's gunpowder, and that's nothing to sneeze at. Fort Point stopped being a fort after World War II and never once did a battle occur here, except for a couple of sock skirmishes in the laundry. At least they had a nice view and could commune with the sea lions, who washed their feet every day and could balance cannonballs on their noses. Wowzers, the world's largest fire nozzle. Oh, it's Coit Tower, the best place for a 360 degree view of San Francisco. Rising 180 feet above Telegraph Hill in San Francisco, Coit Tower was built in 1933 to add even more beauty to San Francisco. But legend has it that this tower resembles a huge fire nozzle. Lily Coit, who paid for the tower, was the most loyal fan of the San Francisco firefighters, especially after all their hard work during the great fire that devastated San Francisco following the famous 1906 earthquake. I bet the firefighters could have used a nozzle this size in 1906. According to my gadget map, we're either at the Great Pyramids of Egypt or in the middle of San Francisco staring at the Transamerica Pyramid. It's even taller than the Golden Gate Bridge. Time to investigate. Go, go, gadget copter. According to my keen detective sense, the Transamerica Pyramid Building is an 853 foot tall skyscraper. Wowzers! This pyramid has 6,000 windows, which is good news for the window washers. There are 50 floors of offices bustling with activity, and there's absolutely nothing inside that hollow spire on the top. Hey, I think I see my heart over there in San Francisco, right there by my left valve intake. I hope you had a great time on our field trip, scaling the Golden Gate Bridge, sneaking a peek at the Great Glass Pyramid, taking a gander at the Court Tower fire hose, and fooling around at Fort Point. Until next time, go, go, gadget field trip.